Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you all. Um, it's lovely to have Steve and family joining us to the, joining with us again today. I think this is the first time since um, before COVID, so um, it's lovely to have you joining us to lead us in worship today. Um, warm welcome to those who are joining on Zoom. I think we've got Jim and Eileen from way up in Scotland joining us today. So. Um, that's good, and obviously a welcome to those who will watch this service on YouTube afterwards. And a warm welcome to our visitors today. Um, I'm glad you've had a, a good week in Market Bosworth and, uh, and a safe return when you go home. Um, I'd like to just thank Sheila and Brian, and Barry and Maeve, and Jean and Roy for um, their work yesterday welcoming the ride and striders. <coughs> we have had quite a number of people dropping in and um, so just to thank you to them for being here to welcome people. Um, we had a, a good mess of church yesterday and um, there was uh, quite a lot of mess afterwards as you can <laughs> from messy church but we were um, having a think about the story of um, the rich farmer who um, pulled down his barns and built big barns so we were building barns out of spaghetti and marshmallows and we've got quite a bit of spaghetti and marshmallow on the floor afterwards but it was a good afternoon and the next one will be on the 16th of October when we do hope to get back to being a little bit more normal and being able to provide food rather than people bringing a picnic with them so if you would be available on the 16th of October to help us then that would be greatly appreciated and if you could just have a word with me about that um, tomorrow, um, we'll have our usual prayer time on Zoom at 9.30, if um, you're able to join us for that. Um, there are a number of people um, within our fellowship that I would ask you to pray for at the moment. Um, we have quite a number of people who are not well or who are caring for family members. And in particular, um, I'd ask you to remember Janet and Bob and Pam and Nick and Nancy and Barry. Also those who are on holiday at the moment, and I know some of you are about to go on holiday, so um, we do pray for you, and we can continue to pray for Jim and Ivy too, that they continue to have a relaxing uh, break for the rest of the month. Um, church cleaning, with COVID, um, we're having to be particularly careful, particularly now that we've got new groups, well not new groups, but the groups are coming back to their activities. And um, Sheila and Anne are doing a wonderful job between them. Um, but if there is anybody else who could give them a hand, um, that the groups that are coming are actually doing their own cleaning after themselves, but um, there is sort of the general cleaning of the church. So if anybody could give um, Anne and Sheila helping hand, that would be wonderful uh, if you just have a word with one of them. Um, on the 21st of September, we're going to visit our dear friend Trevor um, in his new moorings at North Kilworth. And um, if anybody would like to come with me, I've got a couple of spaces in the car, and Trevor would love to see anybody that would like to go. And I think Sheila's probably going to be coming with me. But if anybody else would like to go, we'll be leaving Bosworth at one o'clock on the 21st of September, and we should be back by four o'clock. Um, knitting, we have quite a reputation as a, as a church of knitting for different occasions. We've knitted sheep and scarves for the nativity trails. We knitted crosses for residents of the care homes in um, at East during COVID. And Marion's come up with another project. Mm -hmm. So we're inviting you to knit a piece. <laughs> she's got the wool, she's got the poppies, she's got the patterns. And so if anybody fancies um, knitting some poppies uh, ready for Remembrance Sunday, then do have a word please with Marion about that. And um, if anybody's got a wonderfully creative idea of how you can display them <laughs> once they're all knitted. Then again, if we have a word with Marion, I'm sure she'd be pleased to, uh, to hear ideas. Um, if anybody would like prayer after the service, do please um, come and have a word with me or with Steve, and we can um, arrange for you to pray with you. Um, 
And just a reminder that we have a one-way system, so you come in through that way, you can go out through the front door, and um, again, due to COVID, we're not passing around the collection bags that we evolve by the door for your offerings. Um, that's all. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, hello. Good to see you all. It's great to be with you. Good to see things don't, some things don't change. There's always lots of notices, which is great. <laughs> There's so much going on. So yes, it's been a while since I've been here, but it's great to be back. Thank you for inviting me. Hopefully the Lord will speak to us today as we are here. So welcome to you in presence and to those of you on too. So I'd like to start just by reading a few words from the first letter that Peter wrote. 1 Peter 1 starting verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith is shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So some words that Peter wrote there to Christians who've been scattered because of persecution, reminding them of some of the great things that they had in Christ even through trials and tribulation. And I guess we have faced some trials, not the same, of course, and tribulations over the last 18 months with the coronavirus. We're coming through it, we're still together, and the Lord still has a work for us to do. So let's remember that as we now sing. Uh, in number 50, the heart of worship. We don't have the next slide. And that comes up automatically. Much more. There we go. <laughs> Please stand if you feel it. Please sit. <laughs> Every single breath 
future we have a place in your presence. So our God help us to live in light of that. To realise that the trials we do suffer are no great worth compared to eternity. So just help us to remain faithful in these times, these times in which you've placed us in the places in which you've placed us to serve you. We admit that sometimes we don't understand what is going on and why it's happening, but we thank you that you do, that you are in control. Just help us to rest in that. And we do thank you for the monetary offerings that will be given later, given from what you have given to us. I just pray they'll be used in your service here in Market Mosworth's the people in this church here seek to spread your word. Just bless them, encourage and strengthen them, I pray. And we just thank you again that we can be here in your presence. Speak to us this morning, we pray. Amen. Right, so we're going to sing again. And, um, 76 minutes and Latin seconds. So, mighty to save. Mighty to save, that is Jesus indeed. Everyone needs to love that's never failing. Yeah. 
Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Was a reading there, but of course, we could carry on. So, may God bless the public reading of His Word. Now, have a time of prayer. So, our God, again, we come before you and we thank you that you are listening to us now. With the words we speak, verbally or just in our minds, you are hearing because you love to hear your people speaking to you and you love to answer prayer. So I God, we thank you we can come in prayer before you this morning. And we would do so and we would bring to you situations and people known to us, collectively and individually. And just ask that you will be with those people and in those situations, that you will work in them for your good. So we do pray as Nicola has already mentioned for those people from this fellowship who can't be with us this morning. So on holiday, we thank you that they have that opportunity to get away to recharge batteries, to visit somewhere new, perhaps to return to places they've been before. Just an opportunity in the quietness to just spend time with you and just to refresh themselves before the autumn and winter set in. So bless them all, we pray. Remember those we've heard shortly going on holiday, and we just pray you'll take and bring them back safely. We do pray for those who are not well, or those looking after those who are not well. And again, we've been given a list of people, a list of names. And we do remember each one before you now, everyone. Those who are not well, just be to them what they need. Let them feel your presence with them. Let them know that you are remembering them before you now, as perhaps they're sitting at home wishing they were here with us. For those who are caring, for loved ones, just be with them. Bless them in their work, we pray. Just help them, encourage and strengthen them. Others perhaps not here because they're perhaps too frightened at the moment to come out. Unsure of what the future holds, unsure of where things are going in their lives. Reassure and comfort them. Let them know that you're there and that you care, that you will never leave them. We thank you for the promise that Jesus gave just before he left his disciples. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So those people who are lonely and frightened and afraid at this time, we just pray that they might know that. And for the visiting that is going on, as we've heard again, we just pray for that time, an opportunity of meeting people who are perhaps lonely and isolated. And just bringing a bit of joy into their lives, a bit of company, a bit of chatter, a bit of reminiscing perhaps, a bit of remembering how things were. So be with all those that are doing that, we pray. And then as today's Education Sunday, we would just remember all those in education at this time. We think of the children who have just returned to school over the past few weeks. We do pray for them. A difficult time, a different time, a strange time in many ways. We just pray that as they start mixing once again, that they will remake friendships that are already there and make new friendships. We pray for the teachers who have had a difficult 18 months of some live lessons, some Zoom lessons, and all sorts of different things that they would never have dreamed of. We just pray for them now as they're back to face to face with their classes. They will quickly make a relationship with those students 
and that learning will take place. Certainly learning in the different subjects they have to learn, but also learning of just being together, the playing together, the chatting together, and just enjoying each other's company. We pray similarly for universities. Again, some of things struggling with whether we do things face to face or whether it's still on Zoom. Again, guide them, we pray. Remember those new students going to university over the next few days and weeks, help them to settle. For those returning, again, to renew friendships that perhaps haven't been there for a long time now, again, just bless them, we pray. And we just thank you for the whole education system we have here. Bless those involved in any way, we pray. We do pray for the government as we are asked to do so. We pray for them, O oh God, in these difficult times. The coronavirus pandemic has caused many, many issues. We just pray, O oh God, that they will lead and guide wisely. We pray too for conflicts around the world, people who are suffering at this time through no fault of their own, caught up in situations beyond their control. We think of Afghanistan and the situation over there. We're not sure exactly what's happening, I guess, but we do pray for those people. And now in a moment's silence, we would just remember people you put on our hearts to pray for. It might be a friend, a relative, a neighbor, an acquaintance, or just somebody you put on our heart. We just bring them to you now. No God, we remember them before you, and we now also pray for the work of the church here, the people involved in different activities that are beginning once more. We pray for safety. We pray too that your word might be spoken powerfully in those different situations, that lives might be changed, that your kingdom might grow. So bless all those working with pain, whatever it might be. We think of the message church yesterday and the one coming next month. We think of the knitting that's going to take place, so many ways in which people can reach out, many innovative ways as things have changed so much. So just bless everybody involved in this fellowship, I pray. Just be with us and speak to us now, we pray. Amen. Amen. Right, before we look at that passage, we're just going to sing again. Jesus, hope of the nations. So please stand. <laughs> Yeah. 
so far today. I suspect quite a lot. From the trivial to the quite important. What should I wear today? I get that all the time, of course, with the females. You're not going out looking like that, you know, you're not putting that tie on or whatever. Uh, what should I have for breakfast, you know? Shall I go to church? Lots of questions. Apparently, as they tell me, I can count it up, there are around 3,300 questions in the Bible. There's a challenge. Start looking for them. It's a bit uncertain because obviously there was no punctuation in the original, so working out whether some things were actually questions isn't always that easy. But certainly, a lot of questions asked in the Bible. And some questions asked in the passage that we've looked at today. Some questions, are they important, are they not? Well, we'll have to see. So the first questions of the Bible, they're not in John 3, obviously, they're somewhat earlier than that. They're in fact, very early in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, just after creation, God had created everything. He pronounced everything very good. And then we get to the first question in the Bible. Genesis 3, verse 1, question asked by Satan. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And I think is the first question that is asked in the Bible. It's asked by Satan to Eve. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. So what would your answer have been if you were Eve? Because God had been very clear in his instructions to Adam and Eve about the trees in the garden. In chapter two, he said, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Satan asked a big question, didn't he? And Eve, I think, was a little bit confused. Did he really say you mustn't eat from any tree in the garden? Well, you know, it's a bit of a vague question, isn't it? She's confused and she makes up a bit of an answer. We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the trees in the middle of the garden and you mustn't touch it or you'll die. You know, the mention touching your honey, the instruction of just not to eat of the fruit. But sometimes when we're asked questions, we can be vague in answers. We don't answer clearly, we don't think clearly. And this caused Eve obviously a major problem. So we clear what God's saying to us today. We clear what He's saying to us as individuals, as a church. What is God saying to us today? What is He asking us to do? What is He telling us not to do? Did God really say? How clear are we? about what God says. We can only be clear about what God says through reading his word, can't we, and praying to him. As he said to Joshua, as God said to Joshua when he entered the land, or was about to enter the land, 
take the law, the word of the law of Moses, meditate on it day and night, don't turn from to the left or the right. And that's what God is asking us to do today, to know what he has said and not be unsure and vague, which can lead to problems. So the follow-up to that first question is in the same chapter, verse 9. This is God speaking now, verse 9 of the same chapter. He said, but the man, sorry, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Where are you? Interesting, isn't it? They're hidden. They tried to hide from God because they knew they'd done wrong. We can't hide from God, can we? We can't hide from God. No matter how we try, God is always there. They were trying to hide. God simply says to them, where are you? The great thing about that question is it shows that God wasn't going to abandon them because they'd done wrong. God didn't say, you disobeyed, that's it. He was looking for them. He still wanted a relationship with them. Because we do wrong, God doesn't abandon us. He seeks us out. He wants to talk to us and be with us and help us as he would try to do with Adam and Eve. So there we have the first questions in the Bible. God won't abandon us when we do wrong, but God does expect us to know what he's asking us to do. So we come now to the passage we've read, Nicodemus coming to visit Jesus. So he wants to find out something about Jesus, because Jesus is something new, isn't he, for them? Something they couldn't quite understand, couldn't quite grasp. But he decides, as one of the leaders of Israel, one of the Sanhedrin, one of the religious leaders, he wants to find out a little bit more about what's going on. So he comes to Jesus with questions. Perhaps something there for just you to think about a little bit. If Jesus was here now, which one question would you ask him? What would you ask him? If Jesus was here now and say, you've got one question, what would you ask? I'm not going to attempt to answer that, obviously that is an individual thing, but that's worth thinking about. What one thing would you like to ask Jesus if he were here? Perhaps a follow-up to that. You think you already know the answer. You think you might be surprised by the answer. Is it the sort of question you'd ask Jesus that you think, well, I don't have the answer anyway, but you know. Or is it one where genuinely you would listen? Because I think Nick Davis sort of knew some answers to the question, thought he knew the answers to the questions he was going to ask. But things didn't quite turn out like that for him, did they? They didn't quite turn out like that for him. So Nicodemus had heard about Jesus. It's clear in his introduction, calling him rabbi, pastor or teacher. You know, we've heard about you. You couldn't be doing this unless God was with you. And I'm here to find out a little bit more. So we have here the meeting of two completely different people. Nicodemus, if you're quite old, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was steeped in Judaism, wasn't he? Steeped in Judaism. He knew the Old Testament by heart, probably. He'd been teaching for years. Then we have Jesus, young, 30, untrained, no official position, a radical new message. Contrary, people thought, at this time, contrary. It's what they were teaching. A clash of cultures almost, isn't it? How do we deal with people who are different from us? How do we deal with them? Do we feel threatened? Do we have age? Or do we just get on with each other? It is a challenge for churches, isn't it? How to deal with people who are different. 
And how do we encourage people, particularly those who are younger? How do we encourage them in their walking faith? Of faith? So it's not easy, is it? It's never easy, and I guess each generation says, well, it's different for me, it's all right for you. But how do we encourage the young people in our fellowships? So Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He comes at night. Why? We don't know, do we? We don't know, really. Perhaps it was busy. Perhaps he had business all the time. He was busy. Perhaps that's the time he was free. We're all busy, aren't we? We look at the things we're doing, but it's important that we find time to spend with Jesus, isn't it? In our busyness, how much time do we spend? with Jesus, setting time aside to read and pray, to be close to him, to ask the questions, to find out what he wants us to do. Because he has a purpose for each of us. It's not as if he doesn't want to speak to us. He does. Perhaps he came at night, it's often said, because he didn't want his friends to know. Didn't want his friends to know, those of the Sanhedrin, the scribes. But he didn't want them to know what he was doing. Because he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the religious ruling body. Might not be good, might it, to be seen associating with someone like Jesus, the radical preacher who was getting it all wrong, according to them. Another question for us really is how open are we about our relationship with Jesus? Is it just a Sunday thing or is it all we? The people know what we stand for. But he came at night. That's interesting, isn't it? He came in darkness, the one who was the light of the world. The beginning of John's Gospel, just a page or so earlier in your Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that had been made. In him was life. And that light, so that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. But the darkness has not understood it. He came at night, the one who was the light of the world, to bring light into people's lives. The important thing is, he came. He came. That is the important thing, isn't it? He came to Jesus. And you, and you, perhaps some of you haven't yet. If you haven't, now is the time to come to Jesus. So he comes. He thinks, you know, he's probably got his little, you know, it's like go to see someone, you know what you're going to say, don't you? I'll ask this, I'll ask that, he'll say this, he'll say that. But he's completely thrown, isn't he, Nicodemus, by the first thing Jesus said. I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. What on earth has that got to do with what Nicodemus has just been saying, that you're a preacher, teacher from God, you've done these miraculous signs? And yet Jesus knew, didn't he? What the issue was with Nicodemus, as he knows what the issue is with us, what problems we have. And it throws Nicodemus, doesn't it? And perhaps sometimes we're thrown by things that happen. But anyway, Nicodemus decides to answer his first question, probably not the one he had planned. How can a man be born? When he's old. How can a man be born when he's old? Certainly not what he was going to ask. Jesus is like that, isn't he? He moves us in different directions, different situations, challenging us, asking them what are we prepared to do. And we can look back over 18 months or so, none of us, I'm sure, would have thought, let's say when I was last standing here, it was sort of January 2019 or something. None of us would have thought that we'd be in the situation we've been in the last 18 months, would we? And yet we were. And God has brought us through it. 
And through it, many people have been listening to church services and then on Zoom and so on, Teams and whatever people use these days. You know, people now joining us on Zoom from Scotland, I think you said. That would never have happened, would it, before? So we can be thankful that we have the technology to keep these things going and that people have been joining the services. And we pray that might continue, that we don't lose contact with such people. Jesus is asking us, what are we prepared to do for him? He's challenging us. So Jesus introduces the Spirit. The spirit gives birth to Spirit and so on. We can see the power of wind, you mentioned, the wind, we see the power of wind, the destruction that it does, doesn't it? But it also can bring good, wind farms, rain and so on. The Spirit changes individuals who can then be a power for good in this world. And we need to let God use us for that. There is so much need in the world, it can appear daunting, can't it? But we're called to do what we can. We can't solve the world's problems, but we can hopefully solve some problems and situations that God has put on our hearts. He tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, but we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has prepared works for you to do. I often wonder when I'm reading that verse, if I don't do them, will they happen? If God's prepared them for me. It's a challenge, isn't it, to us? What has God prepared for you to do? And are you prepared to do it? And then we're on to the second question. How could this be? And Jesus said, you know, you are the most teacher. You are the teacher here. And yet you don't understand these things. Jesus is asking us today, do you understand why I came into this world? What was its purpose? What did it achieve? He's asking of us today, isn't he? Do you understand? Do you understand what I've done? Do you understand what I'm doing? Nicodemus listens. Interestingly, he doesn't say anything else at all. I'm sure when he went to meet with Jesus, he expected to have quite a dialogue. He ends up saying, really, very little indeed. This is his final input. How can this be? And Jesus goes on to talk to him. And the reason Jesus came is now revealed to Nicodemus is because God loved the world. The famous John 3 16, isn't it? Even though he would be crucified by men, God's love was and is unconditional. So take time to think about what happened. So easy to read and move on, isn't it? We need to take time to think about what it means to each of us. Because Jesus is offering eternal life, as it says, whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Not just something in the future. It's a quality of life now, isn't it? Eternal life goes on forever, but it's not. It starts when we come into that relationship with Jesus, not when we die. Because we all works in progress, aren't we? We need to walk with Jesus, listen to him as Nicodemus was here, share with others. Nicodemus leaves at some point, I'm not so sure where, I presume maybe the end of chapter, but around that verse 21 maybe, but we're not sure. But he obviously leaves at some point, doesn't he? He's got a lot to think about. Not what he expected at all. He's been challenged, hasn't he? He's been challenged by Jesus. You've got to have a completely new way of thinking, Nicodemus. Or did it have any effect on Nicodemus? 
did meeting with Jesus have any effect on Nicodemus at all? Was it one of those encounters that's taken place? It is in scripture and then uh, <coughs> things move on. Well, the answer is yes, it did. We read in John chapter 7. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? Whereas, why didn't you bring Jesus into us? Well, the question, of course. Well, no one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he's deceived you also? The question, the Pharisees retorted. Has any of the rays of the Pharisees believed in him? No. This mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, who was one of their number, asked, Does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he's doing? Good question. They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. It made a difference. Nicodemus is now standing up for Jesus in the Sanhedrin, getting an opportunity to go and find out more about him. But he was prepared to stand up and say, because he'd been to see him. And again, we have in John chapter 19, something to do with Nicodemus again, John 19, verse 38. Later, <laughs> Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took away the body. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, and so on. So yeah, Nicodemus' life had been changed completely, hadn't it? Starts in chapter 3, chapter 7, towards the, the end of almost of the Gospel in chapter 19. So yes, had a massive effect on Nicodemus. He went secretly. He then stood up in the Sanhedrin and said, let's look into this. Finally, he associated himself with Jesus at his death and burial. Well, I guess the closing question, the effect does Jesus have on you? something isn't it for each of us to ponder and think about as we move on during this week and the coming months and years in God's will the time he's given us what are we going to do for him what challenges will we face and how will we deal with them Amen. so we're going to sing our final hymn number 78 and can it be again stand if you feel able if not please sit so and can it be Thank you.